The scripture reading this morning is John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Good to see you. Glad we're able to be together. You may have noticed on the way into the building this morning at both doors, there's a flyer posted on the door that announces about eight sermons that we'll have over the course of the next nine weeks on Sunday morning that deal with identifying the Lord's Church. Why is the Lord's Church distinct? How can you read about the Church of the New Testament? How can you find the church that matches the church described in the New Testament? Those are the kinds of things we'll be discussing, and if you're interested in that, we hope you might invite some friends and neighbors, and there are some flyers in the foyer that you could take to uh, do that and remind yourself of the topics of that particular day if you might be interested in that. A week ago yesterday, Marsha and I got up uh, kind of early and drove on a beautiful day down to the small town of Pennsboro, West Virginia, where we have a lot of friends, one of whom had passed away. Lady, 73 years old, did not have COVID, but had some respiratory problems, passed away. She was a dear friend of both of ours, I suppose a little bit closer to Marsha than she was to me, and it broke our hearts that she was lying there and stayed in the church building when we went by to see her. But then we got to hear a masterful funeral sermon by our brother Terry Jones. In that sermon, he was pointing out some things that are obvious, but that maybe I don't think about enough. I don't know if you're like me in that regard or not, but sometimes somebody can say something and it just sounds brilliant, but if you stop for just a moment, you think, I should have known that. I should have thought of that all along. Terry was pointing out in his sermon that you can't know God without knowing his word. Now the impetus of that was this lady who had passed away. He was describing her as a lady who knew her scriptures very well. He was describing her as someone who sat out in the audience a little bit to his left, who might, every once in a while when Terry was reading a scripture, and Terry would look up, she would be moving her lips along without looking at any Bible, not speaking out loud, but she had the passage memorized and it was as if she was unconsciously just articulating it with her lips because it was there hidden in her heart, and it was coming out. He said even sometimes he'd get messed up in the scripture, so he'd just look at her and see where she was, and then he'd know where to pick up. <laughs> we knew that to be true of this particular lady. He told us a little bit of things that we didn't know about how her family reported that she used to like to lie in bed at night, go to bed early, lie in bed in silence, and just meditate on the scriptures that she'd tried to learn that day. She could, she could quote large portions of scriptures. And her character and her lifestyle was one that was changed by the things that she read. And she left an example behind her of generations of good Christian people because she knew her Bible. Well, I don't know who was in the audience to whom Terry might have been preaching. Maybe it was me. And maybe sometimes, I was talking to him later after this event, he was saying that a lot of people out in the world just don't connect those two things. A lot of people in the religious world say, I'd like to know God. I really want to know God. But they don't connect that with the very basic fact that to know God, you have to know His Word. Now, let's examine that a little bit this morning. There are some things you can know about God without His Word because He designed it that way. The theologians or the philosophers often call it natural revelation, and that is that you ought to be able to look out into nature and know that there is a God. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, from that poetic language, if I could interpret for a moment, he's saying that you ought to be able to look at the massiveness of the heavens and the design that is all about and see that, hey, there's a God. It's speaking to us. There is a God. And there's no language where that 
language cannot be understood in French, in Spanish, in Europe, in China, in Asia, wherever it might be, people can look up and see there must be a God. And that's what the Apostle Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, when he says these Gentiles... Well, they should have known that there was a God. They didn't have God's word specifically. You know, in the Old Testament times, only the Jews had a revealed written word from God for the 1,500 years or so. Everybody else might get a prophet come to them now and then, but they were under a moral law, a basic moral law where they ought to know that there's a God and they ought to know that certain things were wrong. In Romans 1, 18 and starting, he said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." But then in that passage he goes on to say, even though they are without excuse, that is, these people didn't have the word of God, but they still should have known some good moral behavior because that's just nature. You know it's just nature that you shouldn't kill people. And if our world were following the science today of 4D ultrasounds, our Supreme Court would know and overturn Roe versus Wade real quickly. Pray for him to do that. But then down on in the passage, he says, for even, he says, likewise, they, God turned them over to their vile passions. For even their women excused, went against nature. And their men went against nature and lusted after one another. Well, people without a Bible ought to know that such activity is wrong just because if you can observe anatomy, you know that. And if you can observe birth, you know that people are born with certain characteristics. But our culture is in open rebellion against not only God, but simple plain reality. You can know some things about God from nature. But there are some things you can't know about God from nature that you need his word. And if you're ever going to have the kind of relationship with him that you should, I realize that phrase gets bandied about and abused sometimes but it's still a valid concept to have a relationship with God that's what he wants this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent that's the kind of word for knowledge that you have a great relationship with someone and that's Jesus in John 17 verse 3 that you have an intimate relationship with someone so that concept is valid. And if we want to know God and have a relationship with him, there are a whole lot of things we're not going to know without his word. Without God's word, we're not going to know anything about his love for us. It's God's word that gives us John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's God's word that gives us the unfolding of that story in the Old Testament prophets and the fulfilling of it in the Gospels. Secular history records for us that Jesus of Nazareth existed, that many people thought he did miracles, but secular history with all its bias attacks Jesus of Nazareth. And you're not going to know the truth of Jesus of Nazareth without these, yes, biased, but truthful Gospel writers inspired by the Holy Spirit. You won't know about the forgiveness that he offered from the cross or that he begged for from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You won't know about the way that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, silver but still wanted the best for that person, but that person wouldn't take it. You wouldn't know about how Peter denied him three times, but Jesus offered him the chance to confess him three times and then sent him out to feed my sheep, feed my lambs, and Peter became that great apostle. You wouldn't know about the resurrection and the truthfulness of it and how it declared the truthfulness of everything that Jesus said and everything that was revealed through his apostles after that. And you wouldn't know without the Bible that there's a future judgment coming as it is appointed to men to die once and after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. I cite things. 
I must cite these scriptures. We teach our preachers to quote scriptures and cite them because we have no authority besides the Bible. We can't know God without the Bible. But with the Bible, with the Bible, we know lots of things about deity that I wouldn't have time and a thousand sermons to present. It's a lifetime of study that it takes. But here are a few things for you to consider. With the Bible, we know some real basic stuff. One of these aha moments I should have known. It's only with the Bible that you know that Jesus is Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 says, But we make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to put that together with a whole lot of other scriptures to know what he's talking about there. In the first century, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's starting off that chapter to talk about spiritual gifts that they had in the infancy of the church. You remember from Acts chapter 8 how the apostles could do miracles. Those on whom the apostles laid their hands could do miracles. But those on whom the apostles laid their hands could not pass it on to anybody else. It was the infancy stage of the church that required people to have some prophecy. What if a church had a problem? They couldn't turn to the scriptures and find out what to do. They needed someone to come and tell them what the Holy Spirit said. And that person would likely verify what the Holy Spirit said by doing some physical miracle to call attention to confirm the word of God. That's the way it worked. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, on one level, that means you're not going to have the spirit of the devil and say that Jesus is Lord. But listen, I wouldn't know that Jesus is Lord if it weren't for the Holy Spirit. And no, the Spirit did not come to me and tell me that individually, separate from anybody else. That's what Paul means in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and following, when he says... Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He's not talking about heaven there. He's talking about revelation. God didn't just reveal to Seth or to Mark or to Cliff or to Andy any of these particular things. No, it doesn't just come like that. But Paul says of the apostles, the context in 1 Corinthians 2 is the apostles, but God has revealed them to us, the apostles, through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. What man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now God has revealed these things to us, he says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I didn't see them. Ear didn't hear them. Didn't enter miraculously into the heart of man. How did they come? Through the apostles' inspiration. And those prophets on whom they laid their hands. And then when they came, those apostles would write them down for us so that we could have the completed word of God and need nothing else. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, says... For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, then he has a hyphen there in English, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he, God, made known to me the mystery by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, but has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. You see, Paul said, it wasn't revealed all the time. It wasn't revealed back then all the time. But now I've got it. I'm passing it on to you in writing. And when you read it, you can understand this mystery. You can understand that Jesus was the one who was prophesied, that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus shed his blood for your sins, and that Jesus resurrected from the dead. You can understand that. And you can obey it because the Spirit of God inspired these apostles to write it down for you. I wouldn't know that Jesus is Lord if it weren't for the Spirit-inspired Word. I dare say neither would you. The Holy Spirit won't come and reveal it to you separately and from, from what we read today. The Holy Spirit doesn't work like that anymore. 
Since the first century, since this word was confirmed. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Those in part gifts, those, the prophecy, the miracles, those in part things will be done away because that which is perfect has come. The perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. And so Paul would write in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All scripture has been given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You don't need anything else. There's nothing else that will come. But I can open this Bible and have the confidence that the early Christians through the providence of God accepted these books and that these were what God inspired and I can read about Jesus my Savior and know that it is true. I don't call Jesus Lord without the help of the Spirit inspired word. I can't know God without knowing his word. Another passage along that line. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. Since you have purified your souls, there's so much in this. I know I referred to it maybe too much for you, but there's so much in this. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, you've purified your souls, how? Obeying the truth, how do you know the truth? Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. What does it mean obeying the truth through the Spirit? The passage goes on to tell you. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, when you're born the first time, you were born of corruptible seed, your parents. When you're born of incorruptible seed, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. I learned what to do to be born into the kingdom of God from the Bible. I learned that I needed to believe in Jesus. And I learned that I needed to confess him. And I learned that I needed to give my life to him and repent from all my sins. And I learned that I needed to be baptized in the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. I learned all of that from the Bible. I wouldn't have known it in the years 2021 and 1965 till 2021 without the Bible. To know God, we have to know God. His word. And to know how to know God, we have to know His word. A couple basic passages I put on a meme on Facebook earlier this week. 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4. Now by this, we know that we know Him. Alright, I want to have confidence that I know God. Somebody might ask me, Andy, do you know so and so? And I could say, yeah. And then they might want some evidence. Well, how do you know him? Well, I met him years ago at this particular place, and we worked through some things. We went to college together. We had classes together. We talked a lot together. We used to hang out together. I could give some evidence along that line. I know that I know him because of all that evidence. How do I know that I know an unseen God? Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4. That's separate and apart from what a whole lot of people in the world believe, isn't it? A lot of people in the world believe, I know God. I can do what I want. He's a good old boy. He's just going to do everything for me and I'm not, I don't have to worry about serving him. No. Here's how I know that I know him. If I'm keeping his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Those strong words were given to us by the Holy Spirit in 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4. Now, how do I know what commandments to keep? You guessed it, his word. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you do what? If you abide where? In my word. Jesus says in John 12, verse 48, will be judged by his word. He who rejects me has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now in our age, we have the blessing of having the completed word of God chronicling the fullness of the unfolding of God's plan. You know that passage in 1 Peter chapter 1 that speaks of our salvation. And then in verse 10, he goes on with these, with these rich phrases. Of this salvation, the prophet's have searched and inquired carefully, trying to determine what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, the Spirit of Christ was in the Old Testament prophets, trying to determine what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of the Christ 
and the glories that would follow. To them, they they were trying to figure out how does this all fit together. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were recording what was going to be reported to us by those who preached the gospel to us by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The prophets were told back then, just wait. It will all fit together and those people later who have the gospel preached to them are going to see how it all fits together by the words that you're writing down. So then, we can go to 1 Peter chapter 1, or 2 Peter rather, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We see some things about knowledge and promises and commandments and how we know God there. According as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. But how do I know him? Through his word. By which, he goes on in verse 4 to say, we have been giving exceedingly great and precious promises that we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do I escape the corruption, the degradation, the decadence that is in the world through lust? By the promises that are revealed to me. How do I know those promises? By the word of God. How do I know that I have everything that pertains to life and godliness? By the knowledge of Christ, him who called us by glory and virtue. How do I know glory? How do I know virtue? How do I know Christ? I can't know him without the word. Terry made a real powerful point there that I think needs ingrained in us. Maybe this lesson kind of precipitates the following lessons about the church. I don't know what God wants from his church without saying what's in the word of God. And it won't do me any good to say, well, I think that God would accept this. Or my friends think that God would accept this. Because with all due respect and all kindness, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what my friends think. The only thing that matters is what God said, isn't it? And if we can humble ourselves to what God said, we'll be able to replicate the church that God established through the blood of his son in the first century. That lady that passed away was a dear friend. Terry had that experience of watching her lips move while he preached and was able to pick up with scriptures when he would read her lips if he had something to forget. I had a similar experience like that. It was when I was in Pennsboro, West Virginia, and this lady's mother, who's now 97 years old and has buried three of her daughters in the last two years, When this lady's mother sat at about the same place and I'd look up and see her moving her lips as I would read a scripture, she'd be quoting it because she knew it. She could give you Romans 12, 1 through 21 in 30 seconds or less probably. She knew her Bible. She knew it well. One time after church, I heard somebody ask her, Arlene? No, they didn't ask. They exclaimed, Arlene, I wish I knew the Bible like you did. Arlene said to her, you can, get started. It's not some magic thing. It's not some magic thing that some people know the Bible and other people don't know the Bible. It's who cares enough to know it? Who cares enough to give the time to it? Who cares enough to separate some things that are worldly out of their schedule so they have more time for it? It's those people who want to be at every Bible class that they can be and who want to study it at home. I don't know what God thinks about people who give an hour of a week and never open a Bible in between. Would you? That's his communication to them. They probably pray more than that, so they speak to him more than that. They give God a good talking to, but they don't listen to him all that much. What does God think about that? I don't want that to be me, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. But preachers know the Word of God if they're good preachers because they've put in the time for the Word of God. And elders who are supposed to be able to know the Word of God and to defend what's true and convict the gainsayer from the Word of God, they know it because they put the time into it. There's no magic formula for it. It's a matter of repetition, repetition, repetition. It's not God gave him that gift of knowing the Bible and he didn't give me that gift of knowing the Bible. No! 
There might be some things in this world like that, but this isn't one of them. That'd make God a respecter of persons, wouldn't it? The more you know this word, the more you're going to know your God. Charles Pugh in chapel the other day told a story about a preacher who was visiting one of his elders on Saturday night. And he decided to go ahead and leave from that elder's home. He said to the elder, he quipped to him, well, I guess I better leave. I got to go get my sermon ready, get something worked up for the morning. To which the elder said, no, if you haven't started your sermon by now, you're not preaching in the morning. And he didn't let him. And that was good advice. You don't do that. I realize there are times that push comes to shove and something has to be done that's out of the ordinary. But this was an ordinary problem I led to believe. Now you put in the time. I have people in this world who are acquaintances. And I have people in this world who are friends. And I have people in this world who are my dear friends. My dear friends and I can finish each other's sentences. My dear friends and I can know what each other's thinking. We can sit in a meeting where something tense is going on and we can take the edge off by just a wink or a grin at one another because we know what the person's thinking about that. Those are my dear friends. My other friends I know a little bit and then I know some acquaintances. I don't want God to be my acquaintance. And I don't want God to be just one of those friends. I want to work at it. I don't want to belittle him. I want to have reverence for him. But please understand the illustration. I want him to be as close a friend and companion as I have. He is my father. And I want to be awfully close to my father. Don't you? Know him more and more and more. You'll watch yourself change. You'll watch yourself transform. You'll watch yourself grow. Because character doesn't come because you're born with it. Character comes because you're trained with it. And there might be some good people with good character who haven't studied a whole lot. But I guarantee somewhere back down the line they had some parents or grandparents or somebody that gave themselves to the word of God to get the right values to pass on in their family. But still, those people need to step up and know the Word of God to develop their character. I'm fond of saying at funerals, and I hope it doesn't offend people, that this person lying before us had a great character. This person lying before us was a good person. This person was kind. People didn't say bad things about him. And I'm fond of saying, that didn't happen by accident. That happened because this person followed Jesus Christ and knew what his Word had to say about character formulation. That's the kind of people we want to be, isn't it? You can't know God without knowing his word. Give him the time that is due him. And then give him the obedience that is due him. When you find in God's word that you've been doing some wrong, that you've maybe been actively doing some wrong, he'll give you the power to change it if you're willing to. And if you find that you're neglecting some things that you should have been doing, he'll give you the power to pick those up if you allow him to, for the word of God is quick, living, and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, and pierces even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is not just any other book. It has the power of the creator of the universe behind it. And it will formulate Christ within you, Romans 8, verse 29, if you allow it. You can't know God without knowing His Word. Tragically, some people know God's Word without knowing God because they've hardened their hearts against what, and they've been taught the Bible stories, but they've turned away from Him because they've just decided, I know better. But if you want to know God, here's the path. You'll answer to Him someday. Here's the path. He commands in this Word that people believe in the center of history who is Jesus Christ. He commands in this word that people confess that belief before men, not keep it a secret. He commands in this word that people would repent of their sins and he commands in this word that people would be immersed for the remission of their sins in order to receive salvation. And he commands in this word that we try to draw closer and closer to him through this word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure, sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. 2 Peter 3, 18, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
If you haven't been growing, determine that you're going to once again. I think we all, from time to time, might be able to use a resolution to that end. If you've sinned in such a public way that you need to make it known before the church, now's your time to do it. If we could help you this morning, would you please come and let us know as we stand and sing.